Hello, my name is Ben Lovegrove, and in this video I'm going to discuss the environmental impact of cloud computing in an effort to answer the questions, is cloud computing bad for the environment, and what is the carbon footprint of the internet? I'm also going to describe some ways in which we as individuals can lessen our impact on the environment through the demands we place on energy supplies by our online activities. Let's begin by answering the question, what is cloud computing or the cloud? Scroll back a few decades and most applications were installed in computers of various sizes, from the early and expensive personal computers to large mainframes run by private companies and government departments. As the technology evolved, the hardware became smaller, the processing power increased dramatically, and by linking computers into networks, the internet and the World Wide Web grew to what we have available to us today. The rapid growth included the storage capacity of each computer, and as the web grew, storage servers and applications on the internet were made available for use by individuals and businesses. The cloud then is just a network of computers on the internet. The benefits of cloud computing include extra capacity, resilience, and more efficient use of storage and processing power by networking together various physical and virtual components. So by switching to cloud computing, we're making more efficient use of the resources available to us. The problem with this method is that it makes us lazy, as we shall see. Packing heat. Any computer of any size, whether it's your laptop, PC, or something larger in the basement of an office block, generates heat. Therefore, most computers need a fan inside them to keep the temperature under control. So as well as the power needed for the motherboard and all the peripherals, the computer needs constant cooling. The bigger and busier the computer, the bigger the fan and therefore the more power it needs. If you have a room full of these computers, then you may need not only a fan in each, but air conditioning for the entire room, operating 24 hours a day, with a backup power supply in case the main supply fails, often referred to as UPS, uninterrupted power supply. 25 years ago, when I first started in data communications, the IBM data centers I worked in had rooms the size of tennis courts packed with row after row of cabinets containing routers, switches, firewalls, and storage servers. They were all kept at optimum temperature 24 hours per day, and that model hasn't changed. The difference is that now every aspect of each data center has increased dramatically size, power, capacity, and the amount of energy they consume. With the web and the cloud growing every day, the demands placed upon it mean it's a gigantic consumer of electricity. In 2019, according to KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden, the internet was consuming 10% of the world's electricity, an increase of 4% on 2016, reflecting the rapid growth of the network and the demands placed upon it. Two years ago, a long time in internet terms, an article in Forbes.com claimed that the internet requires 70 billion kilowatt hours per year to run. It helps to comprehend that number by pointing out that it equates to the output of eight nuclear power stations or twice the output of all the solar panels in the USA in 2018. The site climatecare.org has an infographic which reminds us it's not only the running costs that adds to the internet's carbon footprint, but the build cost of all the hardware too. Therefore, between data centers, networks, and end-user devices, the total CO2 emissions from the online world, according to the infographic, is 2%, about the same as the global aviation industry. It's a huge amount of power, and its impact is often overlooked while people focus on more visible forms of consumption, like aviation or other forms of transport. While celebrities jet from continent to continent, telling the rest of us to cut down on flights, and while we may wring our hands and stifle the growth of the aviation industry in the UK and the rest of Europe, the growth of cyberspace goes on unchecked. 
And developing countries need both the internet and aviation in order to grow their businesses and economies, lifting themselves out of poverty and into the standards of living that we take for granted. We may choose to cancel Heathrow's third runway while India builds another 100 airports by 2034 and China builds another 216 by 2035. Meanwhile, low-lying countries like the Maldives, so threatened by rising sea levels we are told, will open another four airports in 2020, encouraging more tourists to arrive by air. So what can be done? All this is not news to some and many IT companies have long since taken steps to not only reduce consumption but also switch to sustainable energy suppliers. However, internet demand grows proportionally with population growth. About 4.1 billion of the world's 7 plus billion people are online and that number is only going to increase. Not only that, but new power-hungry applications of computing power have been introduced like Bitcoin mining, video on demand, music streaming and the ubiquitous social media. The fact of the matter is that cyberspace consumes gigawatts of electricity every moment. So what can be done to make this more sustainable? As you might expect, there's no single or simple answer to that question, but there are things that both IT companies and individuals can do. IT and hosting companies can continue to enforce an environmentally aware energy policy. There isn't time to describe these in detail here, but they already exist and they can be improved upon. Some companies have already switched to renewable energy sources for their power, but the majority of the internet is still powered by fossil fuels. Companies can not only make their IT infrastructure more efficient, but also encourage their employees to contribute to the overall effect. Individuals both at work and at home can play their part by clearing the online clutter and thus reducing the amount of storage our old data occupies. There are terabytes of data in the cloud that is nothing more than old emails, tweets and Instagram and Facebook posts that few if anyone will ever look at again. There are probably quite a few that should never be seen again. So delete your old emails, both work and personal, your tweets and your other social media posts. Facebook has a facility for deleting old posts in bulk and sites like deletetweet.net can help you with Twitter. There's a short learning curve involved in doing this for the first time, but it's worth the effort. You'll discover an odd sense of satisfaction in deleting your old data. It's a form of space clearing, of clearing the cyber clutter. You're not the same person that you were in 2018, so why hold on to tweets from two years ago that no one will ever read again, unless they're trying to dig up some dirt? Live in the moment and retain just a few weeks worth of data. Trust me, your social media updates from even a few months ago are of no interest to anyone except perhaps a future employer who decides you're not right for the job because of the opinions you expressed in an unguarded moment. Don't just reply all to emails, cut down on the unnecessary output, unsubscribe from newsletters you never read, and get back into the habit of talking to people face to face. Shut down unused computers and peripherals if you're not going to use them for more than two hours. Unplug phone chargers from power strips as they still draw a small amount of energy even when not in use. If even a small percentage of people got into the habit of doing this, it would free up masses of storage, lowering demand and therefore reduce the need to provide more and more storage, cooled by constant electrically powered fans. Another thing we can all do is spend less time online. You know the drill and the reasons why. We've become obsessed with the online world to the point where people go into withdrawal if they are more than an arm's length from their devices and unable to check them every 90 seconds. I confess to experiencing this sensation myself, so I'm not promoting something from a lofty height. But I do know how much better I feel after an hour's walk by the sea or over some hills. Get offline and get into the natural world. 
you'll not only lessen your impact on the environment, but also improve your own sense of well-being. Thanks for watching, but don't go yet as I have an important request. Please consider doing one or more of the following. If you'd like me to create a video for you to promote your products or services, go to redspan.com and use the contact form or just leave a comment below. Do the same if the sound of my voice is a fit for your voiceover needs. If you'd like to sponsor more videos like this, go to patreon.com forward slash redspan. Your donation, however small, will help me to improve both the quality and the quantity of my videos. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and share it with others. If you have any opinions, questions or feedback, please post a comment. Finally, subscribe to my channel and click the bell to be notified of new similar videos. Thank you for your kind attention.